So our two warm-up questions. The band is trying to raise money to take a field trip to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They decide to sell sweatshirts. The equation for the amount of money they earn is A equals 22T minus 350. In order to make at least $2,100, how many sweatshirts do the band have to sell? So I'm going to just rewrite the equation in the other direction. The amount they make has to be at least, which is greater than or equal to 2,100. And I'm gonna solve this. I'm gonna add 350 to both sides. That gives me 22T. It has to be greater than or equal to 2,450. I'm gonna divide both sides by 22. That means the number of t-shirts has to be greater than or equal to, I'm gonna do 2450 divided by 22, 111.36 repeating, okay? If I sell 111 t-shirts, I'm not gonna sell enough, and I believe the answer they had in there for you is I have to sell a minimum of 112 t-shirts to have enough money. Um, number two, what is the solution to the equation? If I'm trying to find a solution for an equation, a single equation, that is the whatever the variable is equal to. So I'm going to add 10 to both sides. That gives me 8x equals 64. Divide both sides by 8. And x equals 8. So right now I'm showing you that, hey, I added the 350 to both sides. I divided this stuff by 22. Um, as we start progressing through the year, I'm gonna tell you what I'm doing to both sides, but I'm not necessarily going to be showing this stuff right here. When I speak the words that I have to add to both sides, if you still physically need to write that down when you're taking notes, go ahead and write it down. But as we progress through the year, I would do the explaining like this. I'm going to add 10 to both sides, so I have 8x equals 64. I'm going to divide both sides by 8, so x equals 8. So this is right now. This is what it's going to be progressing to as we progress through the year. Last check for our burning questions, and I see none are in there. So we are going to start <coughs> talking about functions. If I were to describe Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 at the high school level, it would be dealing with functions, and we're going to deal with various types of functions. Um, this year, you are going to deal with uh, three of our basic types of functions. So we need to know what a function is. This is a guaranteed test question on my eighth grade Algebra 1, Algebra 2, pre-calc, and college in, in college algebra classes. Okay, so this is a guaranteed question. So here's the correct answer. A function is a rule. that corresponds each element in a set A comma called the domain comma, into unique elements in a set B called the range. So 
what I have written on the board is the full credit answer for define a function on a test in any one of those math classes for me. The key points on here, it's a rule. The first set is called the domain. The second set is called the range. And the elements that it corresponds to have to be unique. And we're going to discuss representations of that. So that is the full blown definition. If you want to talk about it in um, maybe some easier to understand language, it's a rule where each input goes to exactly one output. So the red is the full credit definition. The green is like a C definition. If you need more time before I go to the next slide, please type that into chat now. Can you wait one sec? Sorry. Yep. So the ones that said need more time, please let me know when you are. Actually, I need to introduce you guys to a new thing in Google Meets, and that is called a poll. So I'm going to create a poll, and when you are done copying it down, you're just going to um, click the done option, because I'm going to. The second option is just going to be a placeholder option. And I will be able to tell um, when you have the definition copied. So the poll says definition copied. There are two options. One is done. The other one is placeholder. And I just launched the poll. Um, I am going to share my computer screen so I can show you guys how to get to the poll if you can't find it. Really quick, and I'm going to go back to the presentation. I'm going to share. Cancel. Cancel sharing the wrong thing. Share my entire screen. Okay, I'm on my Google Meet window. Oops. Okay, I'm on my Google Meet window. You may have a list of people. You may see people down the sides. If you see either one of these screens, you are looking for the triangle square circle button. So if I'm on the list of people, I here on the right, if I'm not on the list of people, it's up here at the top. So I click activity, then I click poll. Um, whoever clicked placeholder, that was not one for you to select. And you're only, only, so if I'm asking if you're done with something, you're only going to click the done one when you're done. And I'll be waiting for everybody to click done so that I can continue. So what I'm looking for right now is that if I go to the number of people in the class, I'm not going to count me, that's two. I'm not going to count Jessica, that's three. I'm not going to count the Jamboard, that's four. So I'm looking for 18 responses here in polls, and I've only got eight of them so far. So I do need everybody to answer the poll question. I'm going to stop sharing this so you can, I can get back to the definition. We're getting there.
Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do an ask because I do know people have that issue on some of their devices. So the one who said they're using their phone, are you done copying? Or are you gonna get the notes later, one of the other? Okay, last chance in chat. If you need more time, type more time, one more time. Okay. We have various ways to represent functions. And if we look at the title for today, we're gonna to be using tables to represent functions. Okay, we're going to go through a whole bunch of different ways to represent functions over the next few lessons. But when we go to talk, it's not presenting my screen. Do you see it now? Because I see it on my laptop. Okay. So I'm going to go back here. First way we're gonna to use to represent functions are tables. But in order for all of the representations of functions, I wanna cover with some more definitions. The first one is our independent variable or what we can call the explanatory variable. This is the input to a function. Okay, and this is graphed on the x-axis. 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, our inputs are gonna be on the x-axis. Our dependent variable is the, res another name for that is the response variable. These are our outputs from a function. And we graph these on the y-axis. The domain of a function are the valid input values. Unless you are told otherwise, or for the functions that we're gonna deal with right now, you're always gonna to try to find the biggest set that you can use. Okay, and by the biggest set, we want to try to see if I can put all real numbers into the function. If I give you specific numbers for a domain, and not, an, not a general equation, you know, so if the domain is restricted to specific numbers, like one, two, three, four, or five, when you go to graph it down the road, we're not going to connect the dots. We're just gonna leave dots on there, okay? The range are the output that the function gives. So I'm gonna draw you two sets of numbers. And I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna call this my set A. I'm gonna call this my set B. This first way is like just showing the mapping or the correspondence between things, okay? And basically I get an arrow from my inputs to my outputs, okay? This is a representation of a function. Each input, the numbers on the left, go to exactly one output on the right. In this case, the domain of my function is one, two, five, six, and nine. My outputs of my function are one, two, three, four, and five. 
even though I have the number seven listed here in set B, it's not an output from my function, so it would not be in the range of my function. So this is a representation of something that is a valid function. Each input only has exactly, each input has exactly one arrow leaving it. So for it to be a function, each input has exactly, exactly one output. Okay, I'm gonna add a blank slide in here. I'm gonna show you a couple non-examples of uh, some other examples here. So the first one is a general way you see it, where each input goes to exactly one output. It is okay to repeat outputs, okay? Notice each input is going to exactly one output. It is okay to repeat outputs. So the domain of this function is the numbers one, two, three, four, five. The range of this function is one, two, and four. Okay. Another way you can see these correspondence things is something like this. This is not a function. There are two reasons why this is not a function. This is not a function because the number one one maps to two different values. This is not a function because four and five are not used as inputs. It is okay to have extra numbers left over in your output set. It is not okay to have extra numbers left over in your input set. For these, I could have also represented them by a table, which is what we're going to get to in just a second. So ways to represent a function. I can represent a function as a table. I'm going to call um, a set map. These two things basically give me the same information. The set map are those two little circles that I drew. I can represent a function on a, as um, words. Take each number and double it. Could be a function. Okay. Y is taking each number and doubling it, okay? And I turn those words into an equation for the rule, okay? This is our rule in words. And then anytime I give it an equation, um, we wanna be able to try to graph them. Now this table and set map they both give me something that's consistent, and this is a list of ordered pairs. And that list of ordered pairs are points on a graph. So what we're gonna be focusing today is on the top two, the table and the set mapping. Um, I already answered this question. Um, where I had the mappings. Okay, so look at the set mapping slides. If every input is used and they go to exactly one output, it is a function. If any input is used more than once, it is not a function. 
or if some of the inputs are not used. So it's a function if each input used and each input exactly one output. Sometimes the representation you are going to get, like I said before, is a graph of something. Okay, I'm gonna give you two examples here. Okay, the one on the left, this is a function. The one on the right is not a function. And if I have a graph, you can tell whether a relationship is a function by performing what is called the vertical line test. That means I, for any vertical line you can draw on your graph, the vertical line will cross your cross your graph in at most one spot. So on this first one, it does not matter which vertical line I draw, it can only cross the graph in one spot. So it can only cross graph once. Okay, if I go to this one, well that doesn't cross at all, that one crosses exactly once, but over here, it's crossing it four times. So if, it, if at any place on your graph, the line crosses more than once, what you have graphed is not a function, it is just what we are going to call a relation or a relationship between numbers. So making a table of values. There should have been a picture in there, but I guess it did not give me one. So let me open up my notes. So if you grab your homework 108, I'm going to be doing, it's actually homework 107. Um, I'm going to be using um, some ideas from there. So to make a table of values, if I'm given an equation, y equals 1 half x plus 6, and I'm telling you my domain is the numbers 2, four, six, and eight. So to make a table of values, you make two rows. The first row is your inputs. The second row is your outputs. In the first row, if I give you a domain, those are the only numbers you're gonna put in your first row. Two, four, six, and eight. Then you're gonna put each of those numbers into <coughs> the equation or the rule they give you. So the first one, I get y is half of 2 plus 6. Um, 2 divided by 2 is 1. 1 plus 6 is 7. Then I'll put a 4 in there. Half of 4 is 2. 2 plus 6 is 8. Then I can put the 6 in there. Half of six is three, three plus six is nine. And the next one I can put in, if you start to see the pattern here, this one is gonna be 10. My recommendation is do not try to go off patterns if you are only dealing, if you've only seen one or two numbers, uh, because I think there is one equation, actually there are three different equations that are gonna have the same outputs for the following inputs. 
So my inputs are going to be negative 1, 0, and 1. And I want to do the function um, y equals x. If I put a negative 1 in for x, I get a negative 1 out. If I put a 0 in for x, I get a 0 out. If I put a 1 in for x, I get a 1 out. y equals x um, cubed. If I put a negative 1 in for x, negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. 0 cubed is 0. 1 to any power is 1. I can also give you the equation y equals the cube root of x, and you get the same answers. So um, some of the things you're going to be doing, you're going to be writing rules. You want to make sure that you have enough points that the rule you write is going to be unique, because I have just shown you that if I pick some numbers, I have a possibility of having multiple rules that will give me those exact same numbers. For now, most of the equations are, for now, all of the equations they're going to have you write are linear equations, which means the highest power of x and the highest power of y is just going to be 1. So if they're going to have you write an equation, um, you're, you're not going to deal with this x cubed or the cube roots for now. So the next thing I need to do is I need to figure out how to write a rule for a function. Okay? So let's look at the inputs and then the outputs and then try to figure out if there's a rule that I can write for the function. Well, if I look at the inputs, I've got 10, 11, 12, and 13. These outputs are 3, 4, 5, and 6. Is there a mathematical operation that I can do to each of the outputs that the same operation is going to give me all of those uh, put it to the inputs, then I'm going to get the same outputs for those. Do you think you can come? If you think you have an idea of what the rule is in words, um, please type it in chat. What am I doing to the inputs to get my output numbers? I'm not multiplying them because I don't have a I don't have the same number. I'm subtracting. What number am I subtracting from the inputs to get to my outputs? There we go. Y equals X minus seven. If I notice from this number to this number, I subtract seven. Minus seven. Minus seven. Minus seven. Minus seven. So the first thing you want to try to do when you are writing a um, trying to write a rule for a function is you want to see if hey am I just adding or subtracting the same thing from each number? Okay. Uh, let's see. Let me make up another one really quick. Here's my X's, here's my Y's. They're, these are gonna get more difficult throughout the year, but for purposes of right now, can anybody figure out the rule for that second one? What am I doing to each of the inputs to get my outputs? There we go. The second one is right. So the first one I add four, then I add six, then I add eight, then I add 10. Okay. So don't just go by what you're doing to the first one with addition or subtraction. If you figure out the first one, I have to add four and you get a different number that you have to add for the second one, then you want to try the multiplication or division. So yes, the rule in here is my Y numbers are three times my X numbers. The next problem I'm going to do, number 12 off of that homework sheet, you are making a 
you're making balloon bunches to attach to tables for charity event. You plan on using eight balloons in each bunch. Write a rule for the total number of balloons used as a function of the number of bunches created. So the um, number of balloons is equal to this eight times the number of bunches. So that's the rule that I have written down. Okay. Um, identify the independent and dependent variables. Does the number of balloons depend on the number of bunches, or does the number of bunches depend upon the number of balloons? Well, the way, they, the way this problem is written, the number of balloons depends upon how many bunches I make. So balloons depend And the number of bunches is my independent. Okay, my independent, this is my inputs. These are my outputs. Okay, um, how many balloons will you use if you make 10 bunches? Well, you're just gonna take the eight times the 10 bunches and that is gonna give you 80 balloons. Another thing it could ask you is it can ask you to make a table of values depending upon the number of bunches you want. So if I have bunches, I get my outputs are balloons. I can make a table of values. If I make zero bunches, I'm going to have zero balloons. If I make one bunch, I'm going to have eight, two bunches, 16, three bunches, 24, and I can keep on making a table of values. Your homework is homework 107. I need to change the title in Google Classroom. Right now it says 108. Um, it's gonna be homework problems one through nine, 11 and 13, um, but we're not done yet. We have, I still have some stuff I need to cover. Before I cover that additional stuff, is there any questions on what I have covered so far? Okay. Here's the last stuff I need to cover. I'm gonna share stuff on this slide, then I'm gonna go over to the computer and do some sharing so you can see what it's about. Okay, I will not be here next Tuesday morning. The stuff that I'm gonna mention below is gonna post about 8.45 in the morning on Tuesday. Your Tuesday class always starts at 10.15 to 11.15, so I would request that you do these things during your regular class time. Um, I want you to complete the Classwork 109 warm-up exercises, just like we do at the beginning of every class. The other thing is there's gonna be a quiz in Desmos, I think it's gonna be numbered 101B, um, that I needed to complete or make significant progress. Desmos um, knows when you're not on the Desmos screen. Desmos knows that when you're not um, it, making inputs or moving your mouse, that type of stuff. If you just stay on the first screen, Desmos is gonna say that you did not, you were not actively working on it. Okay, there, um, the one I'm having you do, I'm gonna go show you on the screen so I can show you how to get into it. <laughs> Um, it's a way that to represent the stuff that we've already been doing in class. So I am going to share my screen and I am going to, you're going to be doing something, you guys do not see this yet. You're going to be doing something that says, guess my rule. Okay. And if you open that assignment, there'll, uh, there'll be directions. You're going to click on this, and this is going to take you to the student learning section of Desmos. And then you're going to click sign in with Google. You need to use your school email account. I'm going to be using test student. Okay, you need to use your school email account. Then you say click join with Google Classroom. If you don't do these steps, 
um, it will not transfer your grade into Google Classroom. Now, the first time you go into the student Desmos area, it's going to ask you to accept permissions. You're going to need to click yes. But since I've already done that, uh, that's good. So enter your names to begin. Um, either leave it the way they have it. Um, please don't change it to anything funny. I need to be able to see who actually did what. So I click go. And then you're going to get an activity. It says, hey, this machine uses a secret rule, turns its inputs into outputs. Rule one allows all integers as inputs. Click try it to watch the machine work. So you're going to do this. A number went in, then a number went out. Okay? So what could the rule be? Well, it could be divide by three. It could be subtract 10. Oops, I can just use those singles digit. Divide by two and add five doesn't work. So I go to next. So there are going to be all sorts of activities that you are going to need to um, type in your numbers. So boom, and it's going to give me an output. Okay, so now I have two numbers so I can narrow down my rule. And you're basically, you're going to work through these these things in Desmos. Um, and it will let you, uh, it will actually give, it'll actually transfer grades over for me. So you're just going to be following that. It's going to help you be able to come up with writing rules. I do need you to try your hardest on that. Um, I'm going to stop the recording and do our homework stuff.